Please join with me in prayer as we think of those who are serving on the front lines uh, in this battle against the COVID-19 virus. Almighty God, the only true God, we come to you this morning in prayer and in faith, asking for your presence and your help in, in all of those that are involved in working with those that are sick uh, due to this virus. Father God, you are the only true God, the Savior of all mankind. And so we call upon you for strength, for encouragement during this time. Father, we pray first of all for our healthcare workers, our nurses, our doctors, those that are involved in the cleaning of facilities, all those that come in touch firsthand with those that are sick. Father God, I pray that you give them strength, that you would give them encouragement, even as they work long hours, the protection and work with those that are ill. Father, watch over them and comfort them and encourage them. We think, Lord, also of our first responders, our, our police force and our, our fire departments, our EMT workers, those that are first on the scene in, in the midst of crises. Father, just again, watch over them and protect them. I think of all of the families of each of these, that, that you would indeed watch over them and care for them as well. Many that are separated during this time are trying to keep from passing on any illness to their families. Father, might you be with them, might you watch over them, might you encourage them at this time. I think, Father, of our, our nursing home workers, and so many of us have loved ones that have been uh, confined to these nursing homes without visits for a long period of time. Be with those workers. Watch over those that are so vulnerable to this disease. And I pray, Father, that you would again be at work and just give them the encouragement that they need during this time. Father, protect them strengthen them. Thank you also, Father, especially for their willingness to be involved, each of these, in the work and the care of those that are so needy. Father, I pray for our national, our state, and, and our local leaders. I pray, Father, that you would give them the direction and the wisdom that they need during this time, even as we think about uh, prayerfully the opening up of our states again, to try to get back to some facsimile of a norm in our lives. Give them the wisdom Give them the direction that they need. I pray, Father, for our churches and for those families in our churches across this nation and across this world. Father, might they understand the truth and the impact of your presence in their lives. Might they understand the teaching of the word of God that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us. Father, I pray for pastors across this land. Help us to be faithful in preaching the precious word of God. I pray, Father, as well, that you might minister to them during this time for that extra encouragement as well as that direction for them and their leaders as to how to minister to their church family. Father, again, we covet your presence. We need your presence. We know that you've promised it and we bank our faith and our trust that you are here with us. So give us the strength that we need during this time. And I pray, Heavenly Father, as well, above all, that you would be glorified in all that happens as a result of this time and this circumstance in our life I pray, Father, that you again would give us your understanding, that you'll give us your patience, and Father, that above all, folks would be drawn to the precious blood and the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would believe on you for eternal life. Father, we again covet your presence. We thank you for what you have done. Continue to be with us. Continue to strengthen us in this time. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today uh, here at South Pike Community Church. We count it a privilege to, to have you with us. And today in our message, we would encourage you as you take your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll be there in just a few moments. As we consider today uh, joy in the midst of the demands on our faith. If you were with us last week, you would uh, be reminded as we considered the, the demands on Abraham's faith and how that even in the age, the old age of his life, over a hundred years of age, going through all kinds of testings and trials throughout his life, that God called upon Abraham again and tested his faith one more time by asking him to take his son, his only son, and to sacrifice him. And as he went into the mount, Abraham believed, and he didn't withhold his only son, and God provided a sacrificial lamb in his place. God tested Abraham's faith, and that demand on his faith was met because he had trust in Almighty God. A beautiful picture 
of God providing his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in our stead. We learned also through the teaching of James how that in the course of our life as a Christian, God allows or even brings these demands on our faith. And the purpose of that is to teach us patience, to, to encourage perseverance, so that we would mature in our lives as Christians. Not that we would run away from that, but that we become stronger in our faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayerfully, God is using this time in our lives right now to draw us closer to him, to help us to, to grow in our faith. Don't run from this demand on our faith, but ask God for continued strength and encouragement. Today, I'd encourage you, as I said, we'll be looking here in 1 Samuel chapter 17 to begin with. Uh, I'd encourage you to think about the example of the life of King David. David uh, and the events and his faith in God, uh, the demands on him many, many times over throughout the course of his lifetime. And as a result of it, to be able to have the joy uh, that he had in his life, even in the midst of all of the circumstances of, of demands on his faith. And at times, even yes, depression, God ministered to David. Father, again, I pray this morning that you would teach us from your word, that we would understand through the events in the life of David, as, that we could understand the joy that comes even in the midst of these demands on our faith. Teach us this morning, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I would ask you to, first of all, consider the demands on David's faith. The demands on David's faith. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, this is a, a juncture in David's life where he has heard about the giant Goliath from the Philistines who is going to, if you would, bring peril against the children of Israel. And David approaches King Saul and he simply says to, to Saul, he says, let me go fight Goliath. And we pick up the events here in verse 33 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you would follow as I read, beginning in verse 33, here's what we read. Saul says to David, you are not able to go against the Philistines to fight with him. You're just a youth. And he is just a, he's a man of war, even from his own youth. But David says to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and I struck it and I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck and killed it. David recounts how God took care of him during very dangerous times. Now, go on there in verses 36 and 37, because this is what we want to see about the confidence that David has in God. He says in verse 36, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Why? Seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And then Saul sends him on his way. In the midst of his danger, all the confidence that David had was in, was in God. It wasn't in his own ability because you notice in these verses, he says, it was God who spared me. It was God who enabled me. Saul tries to give David his armor. It's too big for him. David simply goes and takes stones from the brook and then he continues on towards the battle with Goliath. Again, this, this point in his life where David is going to have to put his trust in God to the test of fighting the giant Goliath. We pick up here in that same chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 45. David says to the Philistines, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give you the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47, then all of this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into his hands. 
He says, in the name of the Lord, I will do this great thing. And you know, he's, not, he's, he's probably a little fearful. I can imagine if you think about verses 49 and 50, we'll read in a moment, that there was something going through David's mind. He probably had somewhat of an internal fear facing this giant, not knowing for sure what could possibly happen, but his faith and his confidence was in God. And I love verse 48. I, verse 48 just encourages me because as you think about this, this event in David's life, notice what happens or how he handles it. Verse 48, it says, So it was that when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David. Here's what David does. David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Now you think about the circumstances in our life. When we have these tests and these trials that come in our life, oftentimes what do we do? We try to circumvent them. We try to run from them. We try to get away from that time of testing that James says is supposed to mature you. It's supposed to strengthen you. And we find ourselves most of the time running from those. But not David. And this would be the example for us. It says he hurried to meet him. That was the result of his faith and his trust. Picking up in verse 49. David puts his hand in his bag. He takes out a stone and he slings it. He strikes the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. His hope, his faith, his trust at this moment in his life, as many others, was in the almighty hand of God. Listen, church, friends, as, as God gives us strength and endurance through this difficult time in our lives, know this, he will deliver us. He will make us stronger for his glory. Don't let the circumstances of this day defeat you. Don't allow the circumstances of what's going on in our life right now to cause you to believe that God is no longer present. He is present in our lives. And we need to face the demand on our faith. Throughout the remaining chapters in 1 Samuel, David is confronted with death a few times by the hands of Saul. And every time God protects David, and he provides not only the means of escape, but as a great warrior, a king leading the children of Israel. David grows in his strength and his valor. He becomes a great leader. Even when his own son Absalom tries to take his life and tries to take his throne, God delivers David. Listen to what he declares of God later on when he writes in the book of Psalms, chapter 31, verse 19. Here's what he says. Oh, how great is your goodness, speaking of God, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. You know, if the life of David ended there, it would make a, a wonderful novel to read, but sadly it doesn't, because David is confronted with an even more, ch greater challenge in his life. In 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, we read the recounting of David's failure. We read of, of what takes place here in 2 Samuel and David's failure in the adultery with Bathsheba. And then he compounds that sin as he stages the death of Bathsheba, excuse me, Bathsheba's husband Uriah. He has him put on the front lines of battle so that he's killed. And then one of the results of his sin is the death of David's own child. But thank God, even as David writes in Psalm chapter 51, David understands his sin and he comes before God and listen to the words that he, he writes in his prayer and his, his proclamation to God in Psalm 51, this repentance to God. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly, from all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is always before me and against you. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. He goes on in verse seven, purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. 
Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He says, rejoice or restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I'll teach your transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. David, throughout the course of his life and this event in his life is drawn to a place where he fails and then recognizing God's forgiveness repents of his sin and God gives him victory in his life. Perhaps though, as David, there's those battles of depression. I imagine right now there's many sitting at home and who are, who are struggling through this period of time and that's understandable. And David says in his, throughout the course of his life, he battles depression at different times. And I want you to notice in Psalm chapter 13, David speaks about this. And just like many of us at various times, notice what he says. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily, every day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? And again, just like many of us at various times, perhaps it's a battle for you right now, but I would encourage you with the words of David later in that Psalm in verse five, notice what he says. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. He says, remember, and we would be encouraged. Remember what God has done for you and rest assured he is still on the throne. He is still in our lives and he will deliver us with even greater strength and maturity in our lives. Trust the Lord. These demands on David's faith are not unlike what you and I have in our own lives. So the question then remains, how do I experience this joy that God speaks about throughout the scriptures in the midst of these demands on our faith? I would submit to you, first of all, we have to maintain. We have to not only have, but then we need to maintain our personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the Gospel of John and many places throughout Scripture, Jesus speaks about the importance of that walk and that relationship with Him. And in John 15, He talks about the example of the vine, speaking of Himself as the true vine. And in verse 5, He says, I am the vine and you're the branches. That's us. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they, they gather them and throw them into fire, and they are burned. God, as the vine, we, we need to be reminded of the importance of staying so close to the Lord right now. If you've placed your faith and your trust in Almighty God for eternal salvation, and you've believed on Him in your heart, then Jesus Christ is here with you. He will never leave us. He'll never forsake you. And friend, if you've never called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal salvation, you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures say that if you believe on him, you will be saved. Hallelujah. And we need to understand the importance of that place with the Lord Jesus Christ. The maintaining of that time with him. But then also I think you need to focus on the eternal and not on the temporal. You know, Jesus endured the cross, but he also knew that the resurrection was coming. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, here's what we read from the Apostle Paul as he speaks to us. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't give up hope. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction is but for a moment. It's working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You're no different than me. You look in the mirror, you see yourself aging every day. Start to see more wrinkles, more grain of the hair, and, and certainly 
Most of us need a haircut, so we see a lot more gray than what we normally do. But Paul says, don't look at the material possessions. Don't look at the material things because they're going to wear out. The world is winding down, so to speak, wasting away. But inwardly for the Christian, we are renewed every day because of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Don't just look on the outward appearance, but concentrate on that eternal walk with God. That will help to bring joy into your life. But I would sadly say there are a lot of joy killers. There are a lot of those that, that just want to destroy our joy. I run into them every day uh, when I'm out and about, or if you happen to go to a store, you, you, see the, you see the impact of what's happening. And there's just, there's just no happiness, let alone joy in people's lives. I saw an illustration some time ago about uh, a receptionist at the doctor's office. And she was just downright grumpy and, and mean. And a, a man came into the office and he had a sore chin and he just simply wanted to have it looked at. And she said, go down the hall, first door on the right, take your clothes off. But, 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 and she continues on to just give him a hard time. So finally he walks down the hall, he opens the door and there's a man sitting in there in his boxers and he's shivering. And he said, can you believe that receptionist? She was so mean, she was so grumpy. All I wanted to do is have my chin checked. And he says, you think you have a problem? He says, I'm the UPS man. You know, there are a lot of difficult people in this world. Some are in our churches, some are in our families. They're just grumpy. They have a chip on their shoulder. They would rather complain than exalt. They're not fun to be around. Let me encourage you this week to, to do our part to spread joy in the lives of other people. Let them know about the presence of God. Now, don't mistake happiness for joy. It doesn't mean that we have to be happy about our circumstances. Now, when you read throughout the scriptures, it's interesting the Bible mentions joy or rejoicing about 330 times throughout the scriptures. But happiness, only 26 times. Big difference. I don't have to be happy, but I need to have the joy. So I'm focusing on the eternal. I'm spending that time with God in my life. And as a result, how do I get the joys of this life? Let me give you five things to think about in closing. The first one is the joy of our problems. You know, friends, Paul says it best in Romans chapter five. Listen to what he says. We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience in our lives. Even as James says, there is joy even in those problems. Secondly, think about the joy of today. Uh, we have a sign in one of the restrooms here in our church. It goes like this. Today is a gift from God. That is why we call it the present. David reminds us in Psalm 118, verse 20, 24, this is a song that we sing. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The joy of our problems, the joy of just every day in our life, the joy of God's word, thirdly, and, and prayer, the, the personal touch that I can have with the God of this universe. Don't take it for granted, but, but be a part of that. The joy of restoration, fourthly, as we think about what David says again in Psalm 23, you're familiar with it. He says, he restores my soul. He restores that joy in my life. If you're here today and you have things in your life that you know are sin, you're off track, if you would be, you've pulled away from the vine. 1 John 1, 9 simply says, if you confess your sins, Jesus, he will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Maybe, maybe your joy is defeated because you need to restore a relationship with somebody else, certainly with Almighty God. And then I would think, fifthly, that joy, just the joy of worship. Psalm 122, verse 1 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Soon, Lord willing, we'll be back together in corporate worship. We're starting to put plans in place for this right here at our own church. But you know what? We worship and should worship God every day of our lives. David shares that confidence throughout his life. I would read for you what he says in Psalm 18. He says, verses one through three, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. He's my God. He's my strength in whom I will trust. He's my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord, 
who is worthy to be praised. There is victory and joy in following the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly as we've seen throughout the example of David and all of his trust and his faith and Abraham's faith and trust in God, we too as God's people can be matured and strengthened in our faith as we understand what God is going to do or will do in our lives. We may not see the whole picture, obviously, but God is at work in our lives. Remember, these demands on our faith will strengthen us and, in, and give us a better walk with him. And I trust that you will understand the importance of that, even as you go throughout this week. So look for the joy of life. Look for the understanding of what God is doing. And as he leads and directs in our lives, might we be glorifying him and give him praise. Father God, I pray, especially today, for each one who's in the, the sound of my voice, that they would understand that even through the course of these demands on our, of, of our faith in our life today, that you are strengthening us and you are encouraging us. Father God, Abraham's example, David's life are such keen examples of how their faith and trust in you allowed them to go through the circumstances of their life. We have the same access to you, Almighty God. Thank you for that. Give us your strength. Give us your peace. Give us your encouragement. Give us, yes, the joy that we should have. Father, might that inward joy become an expression of our everyday lives this week for your honor and glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. As we close our service today, I would encourage you as you listen to the words of this song by Phil Wickham, living hope, we have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Might he be glorified in our lives this week. God bless, the Lord go with you.